You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Kelsey Singer. Kelsey Singer, PhD, is an American planetary scientist and senior research scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. She is a co-investigator and deputy project scientist of NASA's New Horizons mission, studying the geomorphology and geophysics of the Pluto system and of Arrokos. Singer received a bachelor's in astronomy and anthropology from the University of Colorado, Boulder. While there, she decided to pursue research in the fields of astrobiology and planetary science. Dr. Kelsey Singer, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about Pluto. Now, Pluto, we'll go, we'll dive right in. Now, Pluto was a surprise. I have been an amateur astronomer since the late 1980s, and all we ever really knew about Pluto was that its atmosphere probably froze out over part of its really eccentric orbit. And we knew a few things here and there, but mostly it was just a dot. You know, we didn't know that much more about it than Clyde Tombaugh knew when he when he found the thing. But then, and it was always incomplete after the Neptune flyby by Voyager 2, we had one more that we hadn't seen. And there may be many more that we haven't seen, but we, we just didn't know anything about Pluto. Then we go out there and we find it is one of the most interesting objects in the solar system. Dynamic, active, and beautiful. And now we're, we have more questions than we have answers. And one big question about Pluto is why is it so active? Can you kind of give us an overview of, of what's going on there? It's a great description of Pluto. It is beautiful and it's a geologic wonderland for um, those of us who have been privileged enough to spend some time looking at the surface. There's just a crazy variety of different geologic processes occurring. And I always say that we were surprised by how much we were surprised <laughs> with what we found on, on Pluto when we went there with the New Horizons spacecraft and were able to take a whole bunch of different kinds of data. The question you asked about um, why is it more active or why is it so active, that is a big question. And we're trying to get at some of the answers to that, but we don't know everything yet. There's different possible sources um, activity. Some of it is due to Pluto's thin atmosphere, which allows kind of surface atmosphere interactions. And Pluto has these crazy seasons because of its tilt, its orbital tilt and its rotational tilt. So it's got really interesting seasons and that moves material around the surface some. But in addition to that, there's also internal energy that we think is causing some of the geologic activity. And that's the more mysterious part, as you were alluding to. There are not a lot of different possible sources, energy, interior energy. We had considered some, like the moons of Jupiter. They have a lot of extra internal energy because of being squished with what we call tides um, from Jupiter. But in the Pluto and Charon system, we don't think there's any tides and there hasn't been any tides for a long time. The Pluto-Sharon system is kind of a unique combination because both Pluto and Sharon keep the same face towards each other all the time. And so kind of like our moon always has the same face towards Earth, but Earth doesn't have the same face towards the moon. But with Pluto and Sharon, they both keep the same face towards each other all the time. So really the only other source is just from the rocky material inside Pluto. Pluto is about two thirds rocky material in the middle and one third icy material on the exterior. And that rocky material has radioactive decay, just like the rocky material inside the Earth does. So we think that's one of the main heat sources. And part of the mystery was that that should be relatively low level heat. Um, but we're seeing geologic activity that requires more heat than, than what we think is produced in the rocky interior. Can Pluto somehow be holding heat more efficiently than a similar object? One idea out there is that you could have in the, in the interior, as part of the interior structure, an insulating layer. 
Now that might sound kind of random or, or ad hoc, but we have seen such structures potentially form in, in other circumstances and all of the materials necessary and the conditions necessary are, are there on Pluto. This has been modeled as possible. And just like if you have an insulating mug, it keeps the heat in. But now imagine that you're ha adding more heat into the mug and you can just kind of build that heat up over time. And that's what an insulating layer might do. This is just one idea. I think there's plenty of room for other creative ideas, but that is one idea that also fits with some of the cryovolcanic terrain that we see. With the uh, cryovolcanic activity, that seems, uh, some of it, some of what you found, the uh, cryovolcanoes seem to have, at least in geologic terms, erupted recently. So whatever this is, it's still ongoing at Pluto, right? Yeah, we expect that it could be ongoing. We can't put an exact date on any of the pieces of the terrain that we've seen, because for example, we don't have any samples of this and it's difficult to do. We can put some very upper limit constraints, meaning no older than some of the areas, just because we do not see any impact craters there. And we know impact craters form over time. So if they're not there, they had to be erased. And we think this crab volcanic process is what's doing the erasure. And so we suspect that some of the areas we see were maybe in the last few hundred million years, which I know still sounds old, but it's not that old for geology. And we cannot say that the activity has ended. Just like volcanism on Earth, it looks like this might be kind of an episodic process. And so there, we, we have no idea if there's more episodes to come in the future. There very well may be. Now, the profile of cratering. Now, when we look at the inner solar system and we see Mercury and the moon and all that, we see very, very heavily cratered objects. Do things crater in the outer solar system at a different rate than the inner solar system? In other words, is it less at Pluto? The overall rates are a little bit different, but we do see still areas on Pluto that have quite a few craters. Um, it's still a little bit less than, than what we see in the very heavily cratered areas of, say, the moon, but we know that craters do form over time. And so Pluto is a great example of this because there's some areas that are heavily cratered, so we can get some idea of the overall rate over time. And there's some areas that have no craters at all and they're super, super young. And it just so happens that some of these are like right next to each other sometimes too. So that's really telling you about um, all the activity, different kinds of activity that's occurring on Pluto because we see different kinds of terrain that have no craters on them. Now, when you look at the terrain from afar, does Pluto sort of fit in the same categories in Solidus and Europa or is it being its own planet? a bit different as far as, its, as far as its characteristics go geologically on the surface? Yeah, that's a great question comparing Pluto to these other bodies, uh, other icy bodies even. All of them have some unique geology and some similar. On Pluto, some things that we see that are similar are uh, craters, for example, or even some of the types of fractures and tectonics that we see. When you have an icy body, some of them, even Pluto, might still have an internal ocean today. Others are maybe completely frozen out of their internal ocean, but we know that these icy worlds had oceans in, in the past for sure, and some of them retained it into the present. And when you freeze ice, as people are hopefully familiar with, it expands when you freeze water into ice. And that creates a lot of the fractures that we see at the surface. As far as different features, then each of these worlds has these really crazy, unique features on it. And so those are different across all of the worlds. And for example, this crab volcanic terrain, there's nothing anywhere else in the solar system that looks like what we see on Pluto. I guess a major difference here is the, the flexing that occurs at, at uh, Europa, particularly in Enceladus, whereas you don't have this so much with Pluto. So. Can the effect that Sharon has on that cyst on, on Pluto itself, it's just not enough for any tidal, real tidal flexing, right? Yeah, there's just not any tide, tidal energy that we think is left in the system. Pluto and Sharon, as I mentioned, are actually at their tidal end state is what we call it. And eventually the Earth might be at this and the moon might be in this tidal end state, but uh, it would take a very long time. So that in this tidal end state, 
Pluto and Charon keep the same face to each other all the time. So there's there's nothing um, changing about the system. There's no little tweaks. Like that's what it, um, induces the tides in the Jupiter system. So there's just nothing changing. Everything's kind of just locked in place. One interesting feature of Charon is that it has a stain on it, a dark spot. And that the culprit there is Pluto losing material. And even better, it seems to involve things like tholins, which is organic chemistry. What is a uh, what is that sort of how does that work? And how long has it taken for that deposit to have occurred? There are some different theories about how we, Sharon got its red polar area. Sometimes we like to joke and say Sharon has red hair. But one idea is that this is processed methane. And we know that there's methane in the atmosphere of Pluto. And we know that that's escaping off of the, off of the atmosphere of Pluto. So one idea is that it deposits on the pole of Sharon and gets kind of processed over time. And that would imply that it's a relatively thin deposit and we can kind of see around the edges of the deposit it thins out it's not you know it's not as dark or, or red there but again there's plenty of room for for different ideas about how this this red polar cap got there but that's a unique feature of sharon the idea of pluto's atmosphere being transient meaning that in part of its orbit it has it and in another part it doesn't have it is that still the case yeah we still think that when Pluto moves farther away from the sun, its atmosphere will probably completely collapse out. So Pluto varies its distance from the sun between 30 times farther than the Earth is from the sun and 50 times. So it actually has a really big um, range in distances. And there's kind of a, a question that often comes up about what causes the seasons on Earth. And people often have a misconception about it that it's the Earth's changing distance from the sun that causes seasons, but that's not the case on Earth. Our seasons are caused by our 23 degree tilt. And on Pluto, both its tilt, which is a much bigger tilt, it's 120 degrees tilt, and its changing distance from the sun actually affect its seasons. So in addition to the, the just generally having a summer place and a winter place, you can also have this atmosphere completely collapse out and we have not seen it happen yet, but Pluto is still kind of close to the closest point in its, its orbit to the sun. So we expect we will see this, uh, the atmosphere collapse out over time. It's actually pretty amazing if you think about it, seasons on another world and that other objects experience something similar to what we do. And it's just amazing that we can, we can actually see that. Although with Pluto, it takes a very long time. I think its orbit is what, 240 something years. Now, organics on Pluto and that possible subsurface ocean. First of all, let's get to the water itself. If there is indeed a subsurface ocean there, it probably still needs to be some sort of mix like ammonia and water, right? As opposed to just, just pure salt water like an ocean on Earth. So it, it would have another component that we don't have here, right? The composition of the icy shell of Pluto and also what we are inferring for these icy volcanic regions is mostly water ice with other stuff mixed in. And likely things to be mixed in are something that would cause the melting temperature to be lower, just like we throw salt on the road. There's other salts on Pluto that could be responsible for this, including ammonia and methanol, both of which we do see spectrally on the surface of, of Pluto. And those would both really help with lowering the, lowering the melting temperature. There's also just the other ices that we see on the surface of Pluto. And that's because the surface of Pluto is so cold. It's uh, average surface temperature is about 40 Kelvin, which is about 300 and minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold. And we see nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide all as ices on the surface of Pluto instead of as gases like they are on Earth. And we figure there's probably some of those mixed in as well. We see them across the, the surface of Pluto. And so we think there is definitely a, a mixture of ices, but it's predominant, predominantly water ice in the icy shell in general, but also in this cryovolcanic region. Now, jets. We see with Enceladus, we see jets 
of uh, material coming, which probably originates in the ocean there, leaving the planet, spraying off the planet. Now, do we have anything like that at Pluto? Was any sort of interaction with space found with the ocean below, like through fissures or something like that? We definitely did a search for anything that might be similar to a plume. In addition to Enceladus having plumes, Europa, the moon of Jupiter might have plumes, and uh, Triton, which is a moon of Neptune and possibly a former sibling of, of Pluto, may likely have originated from the Kuiper belt, has some plumed activity as well. It's different. They're different again on, on all the worlds. So we did a pretty as much searching as we could. We didn't have a long time horizon to look for changes in the surface or that kind of thing, but we did did do that with the images that we got. And we didn't see anything change. We didn't see anything shooting up, unfortunately, off of the surface. And so we didn't see any plumes while we were there, but they they could have they could be in existence and we were didn't have the right data to be able to see them. Now with Triton, moon of uh, Neptune, you definitely saw cryogenic action there. That was it was blatantly obvious the moment everyone saw it because they were actually erupting. But they seem to be geyser-like, you know, as opposed to what you see, like the plumes at um, Europa and Enceladus. And further still is, is Pluto's volcanoes, which look like, almost like shield volcanoes. Would you characterize them that, like that? We actually, that's a great analogy to try to think about the volcanoes on Pluto as compared to um, different kinds of volcanoes that we see across the solar system. And there's some similarities and some differences. So for a shield volcano, say on Earth or on Mars, Olympus Mons is a very large shield volcano. We do see these very broad mounds with kind of shallowly sloped flanks. And we see very broad mounds on Pluto, but there's some key differences. One is that there are no calderas at the top of the structures. And the other is that the uh, typical shield volcano will have kind of smooth sides because it's formed by thin kind of watery flows coming out. Um, I should say liquidy since they're liquid rock. But uh, for Pluto, we see very, very lumpy, not smooth at all sides. Um, and so there's some, there's some pretty big differences. Now, one weird thing about Pluto is that its surface seems to have reoriented itself. In other words, it's sitting on a, a layer of liquid and it slipped. How do we know that? Part of the evidence for the global subsurface ocean on Pluto, at least in the past and maybe still into the present, is that we see a very large feature, which is a giant impact basin that's filled with a giant nitrogen ice sheet. Uh, and this unique feature is located on the equator of Pluto. And it's very unlikely that it formed there originally. It's much more likely that it formed somewhere else. And because it, it creates um, a kind of mass imbalance, this drives can drive reorientation of the entire ice shell. And the reason the ice shell can can move and shift is because of that global ocean underneath. So we, we see um, this kind of effect happen in other places as well. And so we think that that's a sign that this whole ice shell over the ocean has been able to reorient. Now that would also tend to be a strike against the idea of a partial ocean. In other words, a pocket ocean as opposed to a complete true global ocean under there, right? You could have both a global subsurface ocean and some pockets closer to the surface, let's say, of water. But it does seem to indicate that you have at least the global subsurface ocean, at least in the past. Now, it, that, that brings up an interesting question. The radioactive decay does not go forever. You know, eventually it, it weakens and goes away, which opens up the possibility of Pluto freezing solid completely, right? Even if there is a biosphere under there. We have been doing models of Pluto's interior for quite a while, even before New Horizons got there and started to collect some more evidence. And these models say that the subsurface ocean will be freezing slowly over time, but how quickly it freezes and how long it lasts, those are model dependent and we don't quite know what the, the outcome has been. And even if we still have a subsurface ocean today on Pluto, 
it is presumed that yes, it will eventually completely freeze out. Other Kuiper Belt objects like Eris, since Pluto is the way it is, and is you know sporting an apparent ocean, what of these other objects? Could most of the oceans of the solar system actually be located in the outer solar system? Yeah, in addition to Pluto, there are many other fascinating Kuiper Belt objects. Eris, as you mentioned, is one of the other large objects. It's similar in size to Pluto. The other larger ones are, are smaller, um, but still not, not too small. And we know that Eris, for example, has a really bright surface. So we think that maybe it's got some of the similar um, things going on as we see on Pluto because there are some very bright areas of Pluto. And it's quite likely that Eris could also host a subsurface ocean. And some of these other kind of intermediate size Kuiper Belt objects could as well. They, the, the smaller ones may have frozen out by now, but they might have had oceans in the past. But there is a lot of potential for either um, past or present subsurface oceans in a pretty high volume in the Kuiper Belt. Now, the future of New Horizons. Now, I remember after the Pluto flyby and then the Ultima Thule flyby, which I think that's been renamed. After those, there was some fuel left and everybody was looking for a target. Has there been a target uh, for New Horizons, a new one? Has that, has that come up yet? Have they chosen anything? We were very lucky to be able to go by uh, this kind of snow person shaped object way out even farther than Pluto. And that object has been renamed Arakoth, which is a Native American word for sky in the Powhatan language, which is the tribes that were native to the Maryland region where the New Horizons spacecraft was built. And so Arakoth is a fascinating object. It's really telling us about the building blocks of the solar system. It's only about 35 kilometers across but because it has this head and body structure <laughs> that makes it kind of look like a, a snow person, that's telling us that these things came together. They were kind of more of a binary object that very slowly fell in on itself and came together. And that's telling us all sorts of stuff about how objects formed in the early solar system. And of course, New Horizons is searching for another flyby target. We are conducting telescopic campaigns to look for this. Um, but we are getting towards the edge of the known Kuiper belt, and we think that the density of objects is probably really dropping off, unfortunately. So we haven't found anything yet, but we're going to keep looking. In regards to the future of New Horizons, probe like Voyager 2 didn't stop doing science after it finished its planetary tour. It's still measuring things like, you know, outer very, very far edges of the solar system where the sun's influence begins to wane. Can we do that with, a, with New Horizons? Can we repurpose it as a probe of the far outer solar system? So I'm a geologist and I focus a lot on the geology instruments, but that's a great question because New Horizons has a lot of instruments for sensing the space environment. It can measure plasma and particles and dust. And so it is very complementary to some of the Voyager instruments, um, plus having some additional capabilities. So we will continue out. We are currently just heading almost straight, but not exactly straight, but almost straight out of the, the solar system. And we're just going to keep on going, similar to the Voyagers. We have enough power, we believe, to still communicate with the spacecraft into the mid to late 2030s. But unfortunately, we, we don't have quite um, as much power as the Voyagers did. So we will be complementary to them. And in addition, we're also doing observations of our solar system by looking back. So there's nothing else in the solar system that has the viewpoint that New Horizons does. And so you can collect a lot of unique data looking back at Kuiper Belt objects, looking back at the giant planets, we did take a, a picture of Earth, although you cannot see Earth <laughs> in the picture. So we, we're still poised to do quite a bit of interesting science. What was it like when you, you know, the general sense of the team and your own, when you first saw Pluto, the first images from New Horizon came down, what was the atmosphere? Was it, for me, I have to admit, it was shock. I expected a rock, you know, an icy rock. And it's, no, that's not what we saw. <laughs> so what went through your head when, uh, when the, we first saw this world? I was very lucky to be at the encounter with Pluto in 2015. And there was a big release of, of some of the initial images where you could really start to see the geology. And then later, even some of the more 
um, higher resolution pictures. And it was, it was pretty exciting. And we were all very surprised to see such diverse geology and to see such crazy features that we hadn't seen anywhere else in the solar system. So it's kind of hard to beat that. I, I hope it's a, not a once in a lifetime experience, but a few in a lifetime experience. And it was interesting to kind of start from the ground up and just try to figure out what some of these features were. Now, the actual volcanoes themselves are unique to Pluto. And as you said, Pluto has unique features. And that's interesting because imagine what features other Kuiper Belt objects have that we don't know about yet. Every one's going to be unique, apparently. Now, what is what would a volcanic eruption on Pluto look like? What would the what would the, the lava, so to speak, how would that flow? What would it look like? And how does it differ from Earth? How we imagine that an eruption might occur on Pluto is that you have a vent source in volcan volcanism anywhere. You always have some kind of plumbing system under the um, surface. So this could be a fracture. Often it's a fracture. Sometimes it's not just, say, a single vent. It might be erupting along a fracture. But we imagine we have this mobile material coming up from the subsurface. And we don't think it's very fluidy or liquidy. We think it's probably more slushy. So it could be sort of a mixture of ice and water or even complete what we call completely what we call solid state. So solid state flow is like a glacier. The glacier is a solid, but it can still flow. And we think this could be similar to the ice on Pluto erupting in a cryovolcanic event. So we don't think it's a big explosive event because we just see no evidence of that. We think it's probably more of a slow oozing event that slowly builds up these large structures. It'd be amazing to put a seismograph on the surface of Pluto and because that's got to it's got to be moving all of that ice. And with that sort of movement going on and cryovolcanic acti activity, I imagine you have all sorts of weird <laughs> vibrations and things uh, in the seismology. Wouldn't you imagine? Yeah, I love the idea of putting seismometers on Pluto. I'm all for it. You know, you you might get some indication, as you just mentioned, of the actual action of the flow of the material, but you also might be able to just learn about the subsurface plumbing where, you know, maybe a fracture is opening and that's what allows the material to ascend to the surface. So I'm, I'm sold and sign me up for your seismometer mission. I'll be sure to scream it from the rooftops. Now, what is the future for Pluto? Do we have any plans, even something pre preliminary to go back and study it more in depth? We have started the next steps for returning to Pluto. And those are in the very early stages. And it, it always starts this way when you're planning a mission. You gotta start somewhere. And we would love to go back with an orbiter. Unfortunately, um, that's quite expensive. The good part is that it doesn't really require new technology. It just takes time and money. If we have some new technology that could be helpful in terms of reducing the costs and reducing the time, that would be a big step forward to returning to Pluto. But there's many, many questions that we couldn't answer with a flyby. And a lot of those pertain to the interior and the subsurface ocean and what's going on in, in the middle of Pluto that we can't see because we could just see the surface, which gives us some indication about the interior, but it's all indirect. So there's plenty of stuff that could be done if, if we can go back and collect more data. And it would also be great just to see other Kuiper Belt objects to get more of a sample of what are these features, what are their characteristics. And we've learned so much about how our solar system formed just from the one mission from New Horizons. There's a lot more to learn. Now, the possibility of life at Pluto, it has the ingredients. It seems to have an energy source. It seems to have um, organic chemistry going on. And... It, the building blocks are there, in other words. So what do you think the chances for life are at Pluto versus something like Europa? You know, we don't know any, anything about any of this, but is it is it, are the chances as good at Pluto as Europa or is Pluto at a disadvantage? Okay, let's see. All right, Europa versus Pluto for life. Yes. <laughs> and I ask I, that because I already know the answer to the question, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. It would still be pretty tough for life on Pluto, even though we do have some of the elements and we think we have some of the elements like liquid water, which is a big plus. And the interior of Pluto is warm enough to host life. 
The surface is, is pretty cold, but if we're talking about comparing to Europa, the surface of Europa is pretty cold as well. But there are some more dynamic aspects of Europa and the system that it's in and materials being implanted on its surface because of Jupiter's magnetic field sweeping by Europa. So besides liquid water, of course, life needs a few other things. It needs some nutrients, generally needs some a source of energy. And there's just not quite as much of, of all of that on Pluto as on Europa. But just the fact that we're finding more evidence, recent activity, that means more heat than we thought there was, that probably means more liquid water and closer to the surface than we thought it was. So it's it's still at least somewhat more positive for life, even though it would be it would be tough for even microbes on Pluto. What of Sharon? Now, can Sharon have liquid water at some depth in, in it? Sharon is about half the size of Pluto, and it's got some really interesting geology as well, but it all looks like it occurred very early in Sharon's history. Sharon has actually a giant cryovolcanic plane, but it was very different again from Pluto. Sharon's plane is mostly like a big flat area with a few little wrinkles in it. And we see tons of craters superimposed on top of that cryovolcanic plane. So we think that that happened really early in Sharon's history. And it might've been associated with the freezing out of an ocean. And we don't think that Sharon is big enough and it doesn't have enough rocky material with enough heat in order to retain an ocean into the present. Now, my last question pertains to some more of the geology of Pluto. The cryovolcanoes aren't the only indicator that there is a subsurface ocean here. There are also cracks and stretches and things like that that seem to indicate that. Could you give us a profile of the other evidence for this liquid water ocean? Yeah, on Pluto, there's lots of different features that are pointing towards the subsurface ocean. And one of those is the fact that we do see what we call extensional fractures at the surface. And those form when you freeze something and it expands. And we see lots of, of evidence for that. We also see these young terrains, as we talked about, um, that are not just from surface atmosphere interactions. They're from potentially needing, they need require some kind of internal heat. And we know that there's one third of water ice approximately on the outside of Pluto. So if you have enough heat, then you're gonna have the, the liquid water as well. And lastly, even just this location of the giant impact basin with the giant nitrogen ice sheet being at the equator, that requires a warmer and more, more present ocean for longer in Pluto. So there's a bunch of circumstantial evidence and um, it's all kind of pointing towards having more internal heat than we originally expected. All right, doctor, we are out of time. Thanks for joining us. And I wish you great luck in um, future endeavors with cryovolcanoes. Thanks for your great questions and thanks for having me on. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.